I love the disciple Thomas. I have a great affinity for him. If I were allowed, I would adopt St. Thomas as my very own patron saint. My favorite painting is Caravaggio's The Incredulity of Thomas. Ever since I was in middle and high school, I have loved taking those online which of Jesus' 12 disciples are you quizzes. You know what I'm talking about? No two quizzes are ever the same. My result is always the same. I am through and through without a shadow of a doubt, the Apostle Thomas. I resonate with his story so much. Whenever I get the chance to tell his story, I often feel as if I am telling my own. Before I sound a little too insistent, I am convinced much of our thinking about the disciple Thomas needs some redeeming. My convictions were confirmed when I went to a devotional supplier's website and could not find one devotional statue or one prayer card for Thomas. Unfortunately, much to my dismay, in the view of many Christians, St. Thomas is still doubting. When most people read John 20, 24 to 29, all they remember is verse 25. The only words stuck in their minds are, unless I see the mark of the nails of his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and plunge my hand into his side, I will not believe. And it is because of those words we have given Thomas a nickname. We all know it. What is it? Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Exactly. Now think about that. Thomas had one bad moment. And his nickname has stuck with him ever since. Thomas carries that nickname to his grave. And now, long after he is dead and gone, we still call him Doubting Thomas. Have you ever noticed that we don't do that with any other biblical character? God calls Moses to deliver the people of Israel, but he killed an Egyptian. We don't stand up and say, he can't do that. He's murdering Moses. <laughs> Isaiah, called, or Isaiah was called by God to deliver God's people and speak a message to God's people, but he once preached naked, you're welcome. <laughs> but still, we don't stand up and say, he can't do that. He's indecent, Isaiah. No denying Peter, no deserting Mark. So why do we do it with Thomas? Can you imagine? Put yourself in Thomas's sandals. You have one bad day. Maybe express a doubt here and there, something we all have, and from here on out, you are known as doubting, fill in your name. Sounds like a life and legacy we all would want, right? But you and I both know that would not be a complete or an accurate description of who you are as a person. The same should be said for Thomas. When Jesus appears to his disciples for the first time, they are behind chained, locked, and deadbolted doors, trembling in fear. Jesus comes in through those doors. In the midst of their fear, he exclaims, peace be with you. As fear and peace collide, Jesus breathes his spirit upon them. He commissions them to go out into the world to bear witness to his love. For some reason, unbeknownst to us, Thomas isn't there. But that does not mean Thomas does not also feel the weight and impact of watching his Lord die an excruciating and humiliating death. 
He walks in the dark. All hope seems lost. He is a grief-stricken man. So we should not be surprised when he is a little skeptical as he hears his friends claim, we have seen the Lord. Hearing those words probably opens up the painful, emotional wounds he has been given. As his emotional wounds lay open and bare, he refuses to believe until he comes into contact with his Lord's physical wounds. While we may be quick to criticize Thomas, Richard Dietrich rightfully observes, Thomas expects no more proof than the other disciples had already been given. However, as with every reading of the Bible, context is everything. No, Thomas isn't there the first time. Mm. But a week later, the disciples are cowering in fear again behind those same barred doors. <clears throat> and Thomas is there this time. Jesus comes in, pronouncing peace over them. He then turns to Thomas. Mm and whispers, here I am. See my wound prints and feel them. See for yourself and believe. For Thomas, seeing is believing. In response, he cries out, my Lord and my God. His words sound so simple, but they should never be cheapened. Thomas's confession of faith is the greatest testimony to Christ's divinity in the Gospels. Here, from the lips of doubting Thomas, is the only time in all of the Gospels Jesus is called my God. I'm sorry to tell you this, but the nickname Doubting Thomas simply does not work anymore. Jesus' scars become the means of grace, producing faith in Thomas's heart. The stain of blood coagulating on the fingertip of Thomas solidifies his faith. He is not doubting Thomas. He is believing Thomas. Now, wouldn't that be a great way to end the story? But the story isn't over quite yet. Jesus's next statement is difficult to swallow. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. So does this mean Thomas wasn't blessed? Not at all. Nor does it mean the other disciples were more blessed than Thomas. Jesus's words are more telling about Jesus than they are about Thomas. Here Jesus implies his desire, his desire for all of his disciples to be blessed. He will stop at nothing to make it happen. Whatever Thomas needs or even demands from Jesus, Jesus will give it to him. Jesus never once rebukes Thomas. Jesus invites Thomas to experience the truth of Psalm 1611. You show us the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your nail-pierced right hand are pleasures evermore. Jesus invites Thomas, and Jesus is still inviting us to share in the story of the abundant life he came to give. Now, wouldn't that be a great place to end the story? But even now, the story still isn't over. No picture of Thomas would ever be complete without also hearing from Christian tradition. After the canon of the New Testament closes, we know the apostles go forth out into the various parts of the world proclaiming the gospel of Christ. While most of them go into the Mediterranean Peninsula, only one disciple goes further east, all the way to India. You guessed it. It was Thomas. 
He is the one who takes the gospel further than any other disciple. Many Christians in India today trace their origins back to St. Thomas. The largest Christian denomination in India today is called the Marthoma Church, or the Church of St. Thomas. So what does all of this mean for our story today? Thomas's story is supposed to encourage all of us sitting in this room this morning. Whether we are like the disciples sitting behind barred doors cowering in fear, or whether we are like Thomas and have serious doubts of our own, we all need to be touched by the risen Christ. And we all need to reach out and touch the risen Christ. We need Christ's peace and assurance. And as St. Thomas shows us so well, Christ is here, standing more than ready to be all that we need and so much more. Yes, St. Thomas may have been a week late, but look how far he went with the story we still proclaim today. My Lord and my God, Christ is risen. Alleluia, alleluia. Amen. Amen. Amen.